Okay, so good morning. Um, topic is signal processing for hearing aids. My name is Rainer Martin. I'm a professor of uh, communication acoustics at the Ruhr University of Bochum, Germany. Um, if you don't know where this is, Bochum, it's uh, close to Dortmund, and all soccer aficionados know where Dortmund is. Uh, Dortmund. And I'm on, I think. Oh. Here. Is it on? It's on, yeah. Okay. I hear some. I'm here. Can you hear me clearly? Mm. Okay. Um, so in my presentations, I will um, explain um, some aspects of signal processing for hearing aids and hearing instruments more generally. Um, I have to say that um, research in this area is truly interdisciplinary, so there's a lot of different aspects and details, and it's entirely impossible to uh, cover all of them. So I will try to do my best to give you an overview and go to some detail at some points, but I also invite you to um, ask questions if you feel that I um, treated uh, some aspect not in uh, depth or your leave some questions open. Okay, so before I start, I would like to acknowledge all the contributions from staff and students of the Institute of Communication Acoustics in Bochum, and uh, especially uh, uh, my former PhD students, uh, Colin Breithaupt, Nile Schmadu, um, Timo Gergmann, and Dirk Mauler, who um, worked on most of the um, topics that I will present um, today. Um, a brief outline of my presentation after a short introduction. Um, I will have one section on um, fundamentals of hearing and hearing instruments. Um, we will talk about then about spectral analysis and synthesis uh, for processing acoustic signals and hearing aids. Um, and finally, and that's the largest section um, on signal enhancement for hearing instruments. Um, because um, speech reception in adverse acoustic conditions, and adverse means noisy and possibly reverberant um, acoustic conditions, is still the number one issue um, that also users have to deal with uh, when using hearing aids. Then there will be summary, and um, there will be also breaks in between, um, as uh, we had yesterday. Okay, so what's the difficult... Um, listening scenario. The prototypical um, scenario is uh, the cocktail party. Um, and at a cocktail party, you would assume that everybody is happy, happy given the booze or the raki um, uh, on Crete. Um, but uh, if you look at these people, you, yeah, you see a lot of happy faces, but there's one that is not very happy. And uh, the most likely reason is that this person suffers from a hearing loss and thus feels socially isolated because everybody else is talking, there's lots of noise around, and uh, it's hard to communicate in such a situation if there is a hearing loss. And um, this is a quite a widespread um, problem. Um, here are some statistics on the hearing loss prevalence and also the hearing aid adoption rates um, in um, several countries, uh, Germany, UK, France, and the United States. And um, so as an estimate of roughly 10 to 13 uh, percent of um, the population has some hearing problem. Um, and um, there's also uh, evidence that um, only a third of these um, are actually using hearing aids. So. Um, that's good news for the hearing aid companies, the manufacturers. So there's still a lot of room for uh, sales and improvements. And the situation is very similar uh, across different countries, as you can see from this statistics. So here, um, the, green, the blue bar is a hearing impaired um, percentage. So, um, then uh, the hearing rate adoption rate is in red, and in green, the hearing aid adoption of um, the stated hearing impaired uh, population, which is only then roughly uh, 30 percent. Okay, um, some facts about the ear. You probably have, uh, yeah. Yes. yeah. 
that they, they have they're to using it. it. And the other one is the one that probably they should have used getting aid. Well, the green one is uh, the red one just as a percentage of those who are hearing impaired. So um, if you look at the, the red one, this is roughly one third of the blue one. Yeah. And the green bar here is this one third. Um, so green is the hearing rate adoption in percent of the oh, hearing impaired. So is the distance between the blue and the red? Yes, oh, okay, yes. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Okay. yeah, it's... Um, not entirely clear, but uh, yeah, I think okay, uh, okay, it's a bit redundant. <laughs> okay, so some facts about the year. Um, you probably have seen that. Um, it's uh, essential for our um, purposes now here. We uh, essentially look at the outer ear with the pinna, the eardrum, and the ear canal, and the middle ear uh, with the malus, incus, and stapes and then the inner ear where the cochlea and the, the sensory organ of hearing is located. Um, and um, the very prominent feature of the ear is um, the spectral analysis that it performs, um, also known as frequency-to-place mapping. So different sections within the uh, cochlea are sensitive to different frequencies or have uh, uh, prominent places for different frequencies. And it starts here at the base, so uh, at the place where the, um, um, the stapes interfaces uh, with the cochlea um, with the high frequencies. And then as you go along the cochlea um, or the basilar basile membrane, uh, you go to lower frequencies. And um, this is... Um, interesting feature and a very important feature of our ear um, and also it uh, um, gives you an indication of why um, the typical hearing loss is a high frequency hearing loss um, especially age induced hearing loss is very often a high frequency hearing loss because here at this point this is a point of entry for the sound waves and um, so the wear of or the, 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 the trauma when, that you can have when you listen to a very high levels of noise, for example, um, is the largest here at the uh, entry of the cochlea and where the high frequencies are lo located. So um, that is one explanation why um, um, age-induced um, um, or age-related hearing loss is um, often a high-frequency hearing loss because this is the first part of the cochlea that is hit by the sound waves uh, whenever um, you listen to, for example, loud noises. Yeah? So, Can you repeat the question? Which part is? Which part? Oh. Um, all of it. So uh, along this um, um, basilar membrane, you have um, uh, nerve fibers connected to the various places here on the basilar membrane and to the hair cells um, on the basilar membrane, and they all um, go to the, um, the along the auditory pathway to the uh, auditory cortex. So it's um, really like a spectrum analyzer, um, and um, del it delivers, so the inner ear delivers spectral information um, to the uh, auditory system, to the upper auditory system. Um, the ear has some very remarkable properties in terms of a dynamic range, for example. Um, so here's a plot of um, the um, hearing surface. Um, on the x axis, you have the frequency range from 16 hertz to roughly um, uh, 16 or 20 kilohertz. And here is the dynamic range from um, minus 10 to 120 dB. And um, in the, the different colors, you see the typical um, range of um, sounds uh, and how they are located um, uh, within this uh, diagram. So speech ranges typically from 100 hertz to um, 12, 14 kilohertz. Um, music has a larger range. 
and um, it, here is the threshold of hearing, um, and you can only hear sounds above the threshold of hearing, and then also very important is um, um, a limit which is a threshold of pain, so if you really feel pain, then you are in a situation where you should not be, uh, so you are listening to uh, very loud sounds, um, but there's also a range below that threshold of pain where um, frequent exposure uh, will harm your hearing. And um, that is this area called hazardous sounds here above this dash line. And um, the damage that the ear suffers is a function of the intensity or the level and the duration um, that you're exposed to it. Um, the normal hearing ear has quite remarkable capabilities uh, in terms of um, speech reception or speech understanding. Um, this is a diagram taken from a very nice book of uh, Plomp, uh, The Intelligent Ear, um, where you can see the percent of sentence correct in, a, in a, an intelligibility task, so from 0 to 100 um, percent, for two types of noise, here steady state noise and here competing, a competing voice. And you can see that even for a steady state noise, um, you can, um, you have like 50 percent uh, intelligibility um, at negative signal to noise ratios, which is quite remarkable. And for competing voice, you can even go to much lower signal to noise ratios. Um, simply you have, because you have these gaps in between the words and the syllables of the competing speaker, uh, sometimes called glimpses, uh, and you can listen or the auditory system makes use of these gaps in between the interfering um, uh, voice um, and picks out the information of the target voice. And for that reason, you can go here to even lower signal-to-noise ratios and still have a fairly high um, speech correct uh, prob um, percentage. Okay, so now um, that was normal hearing. Um, when you have a hearing loss, the situation um, is much different. Um, so here now is um, um, again the, a diagram where we have the frequency here on the horizontal axis and um, the hearing loss now um, on the vertical axis, so zero means no hearing loss, um, and um, it can go down to 120 dB. And um, here you have um, typical phones, um, for example, vowels, or here uh, F, S, fricatives, um, and they are uh, yeah, essentially the, the center of gravity uh, in terms of frequency and um, also their um, relative um, level. And um, also on the scale, you find um, different um, hearing grades of hearing loss, so from normal here in this range uh, up to minus 25 or 25 dB to a mild hearing loss, moderate, moderately severe, severe, and finally profound. And... Um, Obviously, if you have um, a hearing loss of, say, 30 dB, which is still a mild uh, form, then you will miss, um, for example, the high-frequency sounds F, S, uh, the, and um, then, of course, important information um, that will allow you to um, understand uh, certain words and parts of speech. And if you have a larger hearing loss, like 60 dB, then you will miss out on almost all um, speech sounds. And um, will, yeah, you can listen then still to not so interesting noise sources like chainsaws and uh, lawn mowers, but um, that is uh, not really a pleasure. Okay, so hearing loss is um, classified um, in um, in terms of degree of hearing loss from mild, moderate, uh, moderate to severe to profound, and finally deaf. And um, hearing loss is often caused by um, exposure um, to loud noise and music. 
obviously. You've probably all had this experience going to some jazz club or rock and roll club or whatever uh, in a basement somewhere with uh, reflecting walls, concrete walls, and then you go out and you have a temporary tinnitus or some sounds uh, in your ear. Um, you should not do that too often. Um, but also aging effects, as explained earlier, genetic disposition, disposition infections, drugs, um, um, so some antibiotics are autotoxic. Um, they should not be used, but have been used in some countries uh, in the past. Um, and um, here's a uh, quite uh, interesting um, um, scan of the hair cells in the inner ear, on the cochlea, um, of the outer hair cells. You have three rows of outer hair cells um, in the inner ear. Uh, this is uh, from a healthy person, and this is um, a damaged um, inner ear, and it really looks like a, a hurricane has swept through um, the uh, inner ear and lots of hair cells are lost and then of course the sensory function of the ear is lost as well. Okay, so there are also different types of hearing loss, uh, conductive hearing loss that is usually related to problems of the outer or middle ear. Um, so the transduction of the bones of the ossicles um, in the middle ear um, which uh, have the function to, to translate the airborne sound into liquid um, borne sound within the cochlea. Uh, they do not function properly. You have a conductive loss, an attenuation of 20 to 50 dB with a relatively flat frequency response. And here I've kind of indicated this in this diagram again. So here is the um, air conduction, which then shows a loss, which is relatively flat in frequency. And also, typically, the audiologist will measure the bone conduction. So the sound is inserted by the skull. And um, for a conductive loss, um, typically, you don't have then a loss in bone conduction because your inner ear, your cochlea, is still functional. So you don't see this uh, hearing loss in uh, bone conduction, but only in the air conduction. And that is a clear indication that you have a problem um, in the middle ear or in the um, outer ear. Um, the most common form, however, is the sensory neural hearing loss, where the um, cochlea and the sensory function of the cochlea is uh, damaged, or the auditory nerve is damaged, and uh, that's often related to a, um, a loss or damage of inner or outer hair cells in the cochlea, on the basilar membrane, or in dead regions on the cochlea, and it comes along with attenuation, um, also with a strong frequency dependence because you have this tonotopic or uh, frequency to place organization uh, within the cochlea um, and uh, often comes along with some form of tinnitus, so some noises that you hear, some sinusoidal noises um, or um, oscillating sounds. And um, the audiogram uh, then looks... <coughs> different from the previous one. Now we have a clear uh, sloping uh, hearing loss here, so a higher loss at high frequencies and uh, fairly good residual hearing at, um, at low frequencies. And the difference between the air conduction and the bone conduction is relatively low because now it doesn't matter where you insert the sound via the bone, the skull, or via the acoustic signal. Um, it's a problem in the cochlea, so um, you would see a similar uh, hearing loss for both modes of um, action. Okay, then we have conductive and sensory neural hearing loss, and then there are all kinds of sensual hearing disorders, uh, localization, sound localization disorders, um, and um, all forms of mixed hearing loss, of course, as well. So what are the consequences? of uh, being hearing impaired or the, of a hearing loss. Um, so the most obvious one is that the threshold of hearing is elevated. Um, so the, it's increased, so soft sounds are not heard anymore, as explained previously. Um, speech intelligibility will be insufficient, so you have to ask, well, what did you say? And um, then at uh, some point your partner will tell you, well, you better get a hearing aid. Um, 
And um, luckily, um, this um, elevated uh, threshold of hearing can be compensated by amplifying um, the signal uh, so that it's again above the um, level um, or the threshold of hearing. And uh, the amount of amplification is derived from so-called fitting rules. It's uh, usually a, now a software program uh, which is used uh, by the hearing aid dispenser um, or the audiologist to um, fit your hearing aid and to determine the appropriate amplification from your audiogram, which is typically frequency dependent. Then, um, because you amplify everything, uh, unfortunately, the level of discomfort or the level of um, pain, the threshold of pain, is not elevated. And even it can be even um, um, decrease a bit with, when you have a hearing loss, which essentially means that um, your dynamic range that you have available um, is much compressed when you have a hearing loss. So whenever you amplify um, sounds uh, in a hearing aid, you have to make sure that you, under no circumstances, go across the pressure, uh, threshold of discomfort uh, or even the threshold of pain. Um, so that means you need some compression within the hearing aid um, to make sure that um, uh, you amplify the soft sounds but also um, uh, limit the um, maximum level for the loud sounds that still need to be uh, represented, of course. Um, so that is um, um, the consequence of the reduced dynamic range that you need a compression algorithm within the hearing aid. And then there is something called the recruitment phenomenon, um, which is um, a strong or describes a strong increase of loudness um, above the threshold of hearing because uh, at very loud levels, often um, um, your um, uh, loudness, the, the, the um, loudness that you um, perceive is uh, very similar to normal hearing people, but um, um, in order to make this transition, you have a very steep gradient of loudness um, uh, when you come close to the threshold of hearing. That's called recruitment. Well, here, another consequence is often um, is that a hearing loss goes al along with um, um, loss or reduction of spectral and or temporal resolution in the inner ear. Um, that means that speech sounds are loud enough, but they're still not intelligible. Um, so even if they're amplified above the threshold and uh, according to the prescription and the audiogram, um, the sounds may not be intelligible. And um, that's related to um, widening of the, the filters that uh, are uh, represented um, by your, um, by, or uh, implemented in the cochlea. Um, and they are widened when you have a hearing loss. And um, so sounds are smeared out over frequency. And um, you cannot, you don't have that sharp um, uh, filter or um, filtering function of um, the inner ear anymore. And that essentially means that speech communication in noisy environments is uh, severely degraded because you um, cannot differentiate very well um, or the, the, the ear cannot um, tell apart um, the target signal and the noise. Uh, it's all uh, mixed together and um, that means that um, you, your ability to listen to noisy signals and understand speech in uh, noisy situations is severely degraded. And um, unfortunately, and unlike this um, elevated threshold of hearing, which you can compensate by amplifying the signal, this is an effect that you cannot easily uh, compensate. There's no inversion there, so that you can apply an inverted uh, or run your acoustic signal to an uh, to the inverse system and then um, uh, cancel these effects. So there's no direct compensation of these effects is, uh, possible. And um, the only or the best strategy really is to improve the signal-to-noise ratio in noisy listening situations so that um, 
the um, um, loss of spectral resolution is somehow compensated. Also, it helps, of course, to um, uh, talk clear and slow, um, but that's not always possible, of course. So speech enhancement and noise reduction preprocessing is very important for uh, successful application of hearing aids, and um, the main reason is the loss of spectral and or temporal resolution in the inner ear. Okay, so here are some hearing aids. Um, the Lifestyle Wave has also um, reached medical uh, technology, so they come now in fancy shapes and uh, colors, uh, different designs. Um, here is, for example, a hearing glasses with up to four microphones on each side, so you can really implement powerful beamforming um, algorithms. Um, they all have in common that they have to operate with a small battery. <laughs> And that is one of the big constraints. So you don't have the computational power of your PC or even your smartphone. Um, it's much, much lower. And um, users don't want to change batteries all the time. Um, so the um, requirement is that the battery lasts at least uh, uh, for a day. But for hearing aids, you would even require three to five days so, uh, or even a week. Um, so that is very important to design all the signal processing functions in a very efficient way, um, a power efficient way. That is one of the key issues. Um, some um, insights into the historic uh, evolution. So 20 years ago, all the hearing aids were analog. So there were uh, some filters for tone control, most hearing aids, um, two, three, four, five uh, filters to also uh, provide frequency de dependent gain according to the audiogram. You need to amplify um, uh, sounds in um, uh, different, uh, at different frequencies by different um, levels in order to compensate for the hearing loss. There is usually um, some gain control at the um, microphone, attached to the microphone, in order to compensate for um, different um, levels of uh, sounds around you in the environment. And um, here, yeah, the amplification and the receiver or the loudspeaker, the hearing aid domain. Sometimes people talk about the receiver <coughs> here. Then the next step was that um, the Acoustic signal processing was still analog, so um, done via analog filters, but uh, they had, uh, the hearing aid had a digital interface, so for programming these filters and uh, reading out some data, um, so you could attach um, a PC, for example, in the fitting session um, to the hearing aid in order to adjust um, all the different parameters. Um, then, um, for now roughly um, 20 years, uh, 15 to 20 years, we have digital, fully digital hearing aids where all the processing is done in the digital domain. Um, this is quite natural to us now, but this was quite a major move um, in the industry uh, to go from the analog to the digital. It started with the high end, the expensive devices, but now um, roughly 95% of all devices sold are digital. Here again, some um, different uh, form factors, sizes and shapes. Um, so you have some very small ones that go completely into the ear canal. They don't provide a lot of um, amplification. They still provide a lot of amplification, I should say, but not the maximum possible amplification because also the battery is relatively small in these aids. Um, then in the ear canal, in different um, uh, shapes and in, in the ear, and then the typical behind the ear uh, devices, and finally uh, very large pocket devices, um, which um, then also provide a lot of power um, and uh, use larger batteries. Um, again, here's some um, information about um, the maximum gain that can be achieved with these devices. 
um, and the battery type and the capacity, just some technical data. A again, the expected battery life is three to 10 days. Um, otherwise, users will not really like it. And also, it becomes expensive for them to, um, to operate it if you have to change batteries often. Um, the computational power, um, that's just an estimate um, because um, the implementation is also in terms of um, um, hardware software, co-design uh, system on chip uh, um, designs, but uh, roughly 100 to 200 mega operations per second. So compare this with the giga operations you have on your PC, then you know what uh, we are talking about here. Um, but of course, that is also uh, uh, increasing as technology and uh, semiconductor technology and um, all this uh, improves. Um, so this requires obviously an optimization on all levels. Um, so the algorithms, the methods, um, you need to uh, deal with fixed point designs. So you don't have a floating point, 64-bit uh, uh, um, arithmetic uh, arithmetic unit on your uh, processor, but it's all optimized for word length, um, typically 16 to 20 bits. Um, which also means that you need to optimize or re-optimize your algorithms to um, run under fixed point conditions. Memory footprint, you don't have um, giga or terabytes of memory, you have kilobytes maybe. Um, and uh, hardware firmware components and um, industry trend is to have um, more software in these devices and less uh, hardwired functions. Yes, yeah, that would be uh, one way to in, uh, increase the computational power of the overall system to have like a smartphone or another device that does all the computations. But still, then you need to send or stream the signals, the acoustic signals, uh, back and forth. And you need to do this with a very low latency. And I will come to this later. And um, that is a bit of a problem. So you, you cannot do everything um, um, in, a, um, in a smartphone or a third device that um, you have available, um, unless you can solve the latency problem of the transmission. The battery problem, then, you, because you have to stream. Um, okay, so here is a um, um, look into a hearing aid, some of the components. Um, here are the microphones. Um, typically, you have two of them um, with an omnidirectional characteristic, but then they can be um, combined to form, um, to make a beam former. Um, you have here what's called the receiver or the loudspeaker, which generates the output signal, um, and it's connected to a tube that then leads into the canal. Um, you have in the most modern uh, devices a coil for um, wireless uh, connectivity. Um, and well here this is all the DSP stuff here. Um, there are also different ways of how this is designed. This is a, a company um, that is providing this one. They have this a flip chip technology, so one chip is all, has all the analog components and um, another chip has all the digital components, so you can update these a bit independently take advantage of the advances in digital um, uh, chip design. They're just glued together, so this is just a, like the size of a grain of salt um, and contains all the signal processing uh, functionality. Um, as I said before, a trend is to put more functions into software and less into hardware. Um, uh, years ago, um, uh, everything was cast into um, full custom uh, ASIC, um, 
simply for power constraints and to get the maximum um, uh, computational power of, um, with the least um, energy. Um, but um, there's now the emergence of ultra low power uh, digital signal processors. There is now a trend to move more and more functions um, ESP and um, implement them in terms of software. Um, so here in this diagram, you, um, it's, you can see that uh, it will probably allow you to lower the cost of the device um, than uh, more functions to the software side and make them programmable and uh, more easily updatable. Okay, some of the um, uh, signal processing functions uh, which I will not treat in much detail, but um, I um, have compiled here in, my f in the first part of my talk um, is, um, for example, dynamic, the dynamic compression, which um, it, the task of which is to adjust the gain to match um, the reduced dynamic range of the listener. Um, and typically that's implemented in several frequency bands. So in the first step you have... Um, a filter bank with bandpass filters, um, and in each band you uh, have to measure the, the level um, of uh, the acoustic signal, and then you have some form of compression characteristics, which typically looks like this here, with a knee point. Um, so in the lower range, you amplify the sounds. So these are the soft sounds, and in the uh, for the higher levels, you have to compress in order not to go beyond the level of discomfort. Um, so that is a typical compression characteristic that is implemented and controls then this multiplier here which uh, regulates the gain um, for, for example, bandpass filter one here. And then you do this in several frequency bands and um, add up the signal to produce um, the output signal. Um, typically you have two to 20 channels um, uh, with uh, la the larger number of channels now in modern devices. Um, there's no single standardized method, but uh, all the manufacturers have their own uh, propriety methods. Um, because that also contributes a lot to the success of, uh, uh, that users have with uh, hearing aid. The speech intelligibility that you can get out of it is uh, also related, or much related to the compression. especially when listening and quiet. Um, a very nice um, development in the past 10 years, uh, hearing aids with so-called open fitting. So in the old days, you would have um, an earpiece that would more or less close the ear canal, and you would need that mostly for the feedback suppression. So have, again, a look maybe at this slide here, components of a hearing aid. So here you have an amplifier and a loudspeaker which puts out a gain of, say, 60 decibels. And here are your microphones just uh, millimeters away from this um, uh, loudspeaker. So obviously you have a feedback problem here um, via um, the device itself and uh, also the acoustic path. Um, from the loudspeaker um, into the microphones. And to avoid the acoustic feedback, um, um, in the old days, hearing aids came with um, um, earpiece that would more or less uh, close the ear canal in order not to have sound leaking back from the ear canal into the microphones. Otherwise, you would have these disturbing howling noise or beeps or whatever, and that was very annoying to users and um, um, and also to people close to uh, hearing aid users. Um, now with the emergence of powerful uh, feedback cancellation algorithms, um, manufacturers were able to um, get away um, with the earpiece and have an open fitted system where you just insert a tube um, with a little tip to hold it in the ear canal, um, into, into the ear canal, and... Um, this is not possible, still not possible for the most powerful devices, but at least for moderate hearing loss, you can uh, use these moderate amplifications. And um, that is, of course, a lot more comfortable 
to wear than the old ones or the ones with a closed um, or almost closed uh, earpiece. And it also helps to um, uh, improve the own voice reproduction. So when you um, listen to your own voice, um, you, it's an experiment that you can make easily if you close your ears uh, with your fingers and then listen to your own voice, it sounds different. And, um, uh, when the ear canal is open, then your own voice reproduction is much more natural and better. Um, but as I said, it requires a powerful feedback cancellation. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so here is um, um, a kind of um, not really signal processing model, but that will come in a, in a few uh, seconds of um, an open fit devices. Um, but what I want to show here with this uh, uh, small um, experiment that we will listen to in a few seconds um, is that open fitted devices require very short processing latency. So why is that? Um, well, mostly because the sound, um, the speed sounds, um, will be picked up by the microphone of the device, then will be amplified and inserted into the ear canal. But since the ear canal is more or less open, the speech sounds will also um, be picked up by the ear, the tympanic um, membrane directly. And as you have seen before, the typical hearing loss is a sloping hearing loss where uh, users still have a fairly good residual hearing at uh, low frequencies. So at, especially at low frequencies, you will have a superposition of the sound, that the direct acoustic sound, and the sound processed by the hearing aid. Um, so you have uh, two times the same signal, but there is a delay, there's a latency between the two signals. And once you have a delay, you get interference between the two sounds, and um, a change in timbre or um, other effects. And we um, can try to reproduce this here. Um, so I have here a signal um, which um, a, um, where I put um, one uh, sound, it's a speech sentence, um, on um, the left channel of the audio system here, and um, the other one bit delayed on the right channel, and then we can listen to it. And if you listen carefully, we will listen that even for very small delays, like a two or five or ten milliseconds, you will uh, perceive a change in timbre um, of the sounds. And for large delays, of course, you will have echoes, reverb, and all kind of effects. But you can listen to this now. First, no delay. Only the best players enjoy popularity. We like blue cheese, but Victor prefers Swiss cheese. And one millisecond delay between the two. Only the best players enjoy popularity. We like blue cheese, but Victor prefers Swiss cheese. Two milliseconds. Only the best players enjoy popularity. We like blue cheese, but Victor prefers Swiss cheese. Five. Only the best players enjoy popularity. We like blue cheese, but Victor prefers Swiss cheese. Ten. Only the best players enjoy popularity. We like blue cheese, but Victor prefers Swiss cheese. Now you can already hear that there are two signals a bit delayed. Uh, the first ones were more change in timbre. Um, depends also a bit where you sit in the room, um, but... Um, uh, now you can hear uh, really reverberant effects and echoes. Only the best players enjoy popularity. We like blue cheese, but Victor prefers Swiss cheese. 100 milliseconds. Only the best players enjoy popularity. We like blue cheese, but Victor prefers Swiss cheese. And 500. Only the best players enjoy popularity. We like we like blue cheese, but Victor prefers Swiss cheese. Okay. Yes, yeah, yeah. And you listen to the superposition of both. And um, you can clearly see or hear um, how uh, harmful um, delays in the processing are when you listen to both the original and the delayed signal. And that means that you have to keep the processing delay um, as short as possible.
the, the latency, um, the delay. Yeah, so uh, the, typically you try to keep the um, latency below 10 milliseconds because uh, above 10 milliseconds you, you start to have really this reverberant impression, these reverberant effects. Um, so um, hearing aids are designed um, to provide a, a latency not larger than 10 milliseconds. Still might have some... Um, changes of timbre depending on the situation but um, yeah so um, the the constraint here really is not the synchrony with for example lip movements um, which would be also an aspect because you don't want to delay the process signal um, as so much that uh, you're asynchronous with lip movements but that would only be for delays larger than 50 milliseconds um, and above um, so here, really, the constraint is much lower and um, given by um, the superposition effects that you need to take care of. Okay, so here's the, um, the signal processing model. Um, so here is the hearing aid, and speech um, enters the microphone, and noise as well, of course, enters um, the microphone, uh, but also is um, added here on the acoustic side, and um, that gives rise to then these superposition effects and change of timbre. Okay, feedback control. I also will not talk in much detail about feedback control. Um, there's also a lot of propriety algorithms around. Um, um, the the um, uh, task of the feedback control is to... Um, um, yeah, get rid of the feed strong amplification or the feedback between the receiver and the microphone. Um, otherwise, uh, your uh, hearing aid will squeal or howl. And um, a conventional solution is to use notch filters uh, to take out um, the signal at the howling or squealing frequency. Um, but this will also give speech distortions because you're also taking out the, the target signal, the speech signal at these frequencies. And... Um, it's better to use some um, adaptive filter and um, cancel out um, the feedback. And uh, by identifying the feedback pass here from the loudspeaker to the microphone uh, by means of this adaptive filter and subtracting the feedback here um, at the microphone input so that it is um, canceled out. Um, this is an, also not a trivial task because your disturbing signal and your target signal are highly correlated. So if you're familiar with adaptive filters, um, they work very nicely if um, your target signal and your disturbance is uncorrelated. So target signal in, in, un, in uh, statistically independent uh, Gaussian noise, then they converge very nicely. Um, and you are able to identify the unknown uh, feedback path. But here, the feedback is essentially the same signal that is the acoustic signal that you want to listen to. So this, the disturbance and um, the target signal are highly correlated. And so uh, the, the standard algorithms to adapt such filters uh, will fail. And so you need some decorrelation measures um, to um, control these adaptive filters. Okay, so hearing aids, and um, I would slightly like to extend this also to um, uh, implantable devices, simply to uh, show the full range of possibilities. There are so-called bone-anchored hearing aids. Um, so your screw um, is implanted into your, into, uh, into your skull behind your ear, and then a vibrating device is attached to it, and uh, you're using essentially the effects of bone conduction. Um, and that's um, a typical um, measure when you have a conductive um, hearing loss. So here this is how it looks like. Um, there are also middle ear implants where you attach an, um, an oscillating mass directly to the ossicles um, in the middle ear. So kind of shake uh, the staples or uh, another ossicle. And... Um, in this way, um, 
provide an amplified sound um, to the inner ear as well. And finally, there are cochlear implants where you insert an electrode chain uh, into the cochlea, into the inner ear, and uh, uh, provide a direct electric stimulation of the um, auditory nerve um, in the um, inner ear. That's also shown here, again, in a larger sketch, um, a cochlear implant consisting of a voice processor, which is uh, worn externally, a transmission coil, um, which transmits um, um, the information to uh, the implanted device. And then you have here a, a wire and the chain of electrodes that's inserted by the surgeon into the uh, cochlea. And uh, due to this uh, tonotopic or placed uh, frequency to place organization of the inner ear, you can now uh, stimulate different frequency ranges um, and thus provide some uh, spectral information, which um, in fact helps um, or enables completely deaf people to, um, to hear again, to understand speech, to even have telephone conversations. Um, so it's quite a remarkable invention and a rem the first successful replacement, technical replacement of uh, human sense. Um, so quite... Uh, Remarkable. So here again, um, there is um, a diagram that shows how this electrode chain is inserted into the cochlea. Um, there's only three or four major companies which provide these um, uh, cochlear implants, and uh, the number of electrodes used is um, between eight and twenty. And, um, of course, you need to compare this to the number of um, hair cells in your cochlea, which is in the range of several thousands. So um, um, the, the hearing that you can establish with a cochlear implant is um, not comparable to the normal hearing. Uh, so it's a very coarse excitation of um, um, the auditory nerve. But still, um, you, can, um, you have some frequency discrimination and you can uh, understand speech sounds um, again. There are different electric stimulation strategies of how to translate the acoustic signal into stimulation patterns for the electrodes here. Um, all the manufacturers have their own favorite method. Um, and um, acoustic front-end processing like speech enhancement, noise reduction is moving just now into these devices. So all the research done by the companies in the past were focusing on the, what they call the coding strategy of how sounds are coded um, and um, translated into uh, this electric stimulation. But now they're also integrating uh, all the front-end processing that we know from hearing aids into their devices. There's also bimodal stimulation possible, so that means electric and acoustic. So if you have a good surgeon, he will insert the change such that if there is some low-frequency residual hearing, it will be preserved. And so that can be used um, to enhance um, the uh, listening experience. Um, yeah, and finally, it's um, quite expensive, so order of magnitude more than a hearing aid um, um, device. And... Um, Um, the cost to the end user, which also includes the fitting and adjustments and service, um, is um, in the range of um, uh, 600 euros for a relatively simple one to, I would say, 2,000, 2,500 euros for the high-end devices. As you use, you need typically two of them. Uh, there is uh, still a 3 dB uh, gain there. Okay, the, the cochlear uh, um, speech processor is um, designed in similar ways as a hearing aid. Uh, you need a lot more power here because... Um, the, the signal is transmitted through the skin to the transplant, uh, to the transplanted, or the implanted, sorry, the in, in implanted um, um, device. And um, that is a lossy process. So you lose a 
bit of energy in the signal transmission from the outer processor to the uh, implanted device. Um, and therefore, you need a lot more battery power for uh, cochlear implants. But um, the rest of the device, like a speech processor, microphones, um, is uh, very similar to hearing it. And if it's a bimodal system, then you would also have a loudspeaker here integrated. OK. Um, so that was um, a single hearing aid. And a big trend is to um, interconnect hearing aids and interconnect them also with uh, smartphones or other devices um, capable of streaming um, audio data into your hearing aid. And um, um, for quite some time, we already have what is called a wireless link. So if you have a left uh, and a right uh, side hearing aid, they will talk to each other uh, over a wireless um, 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 system. And um, the older ones um, um, can transmit only a few um, bits per second because also of power constraints. The newer ones are now um, aiming towards really streaming audio between the left and the right side. But then again, you have this, all the power constraints. You have um, the latency uh, constraints because you probably want to code or quantize your signal before you stream it over in order to reduce the bit rate. Um, so uh, there are all kinds of nice technical uh, questions attached to this, um, which are also related to communication engineering. So um, what can be done now is uh, at least an exchange of setting and parameters. So if users, um, for example, change loudness on or the, the volume on one side, it will be transmitted to the other side. So they don't need to also change the, the volume on the other side and uh, things like this. Um, also, a state of the art is that um, you can stream um, audio data from, for example, your smartphone into the hearing aid via uh, a wireless relay. So you have a, a little device that translates like Bluetooth, uh, a Bluetooth stream into the propriety um, methods um, that are used in the hearing aid. Um, and um, that allows um, streaming um, from the smartphone to the hearing aids. Um, and now there are some systems already um, as some, some very recent designs which would also allow you to stream directly uh, from your smartphone via Bluetooth, a low power version of Bluetooth into the hearing aids. So standard Bluetooth, uh, even though the con power consumption is low, is still too high. And um, the goal would be, of course, to have it fully bidirectional so you can stream um, uh, data both ways and even process it um, in the smartphone. But as I said, uh, power and latency are the big issues. Okay, so that brings me to a first summary. Um, I hopefully I've uh, uh, show that Hearing instruments are complex, time-varying, nonlinear um, signal processing devices. Um, many improvements have been achieved in the last 10 years, mostly with moving to digital, fully digital, and um, open-fitted hearing aids with uh, advanced feedback control um, in the area of cochlear implants, introducing multi-channel cochlear implants, and um, wireless connectivity is a major issue now. Yet, um, there's room for improvement. So if you talk to um, users, they're quite happy now with listening and quiet. Um, so when they sit at home at um, the living room and uh, talk to their partner or other people, um, they're usually quite happy with the performance. But um, there's still um, several uh, yeah, sources of uh, um, satisfaction, uh, including insufficient battery life. Um, also, as you put more features into the hearing, it's similar to your smartphone or uh, computers or whatever, um, even though you have better um, digital technology or better battery technology, um, the new features will easily eat it up. Um, and um, 
insufficient speech quality and speech intelligibility in noisy environments. Um, and um, yeah, that relates also to the second part of my talk, which is about speech enhancement. And possibly also quality of music reproduction, lots of hearing aid users um, do not enjoy listening, listening to music um, or at least complain about the quality um, for various reasons. Okay, that is the uh, first part of the first part. And um, now uh, I would invite you to ask questions and also then we could have a quick break and have some drinks. Um, so the, the, the life t lifetime yeah. of these devices depends on how long the user uh, uses it, but uh, typically it's, uh, I would say, three to five years. And then it depends on the uh, healthcare system in your country. Uh, um, typically, um, you are eligible for a replacement after four or five years. It depends a bit. Are the um, the implanted yeah. systems? Um, no, they have a, um, a longer um, life expectancy. So the implanted part stays there for quite some time. I, I'm not sure exactly how long, but 15, 20 years. Um, but the process of the outside part is updated then in between, and um, but needs to be of course to be compatible um, to the implant. Um, well, parameters, let's say parameters, they are all working on streaming audio, and, um, but it will, come, will be there soon. Yeah. yeah, we'll see that in the later parts. The, the main benefit is that you can use binaural algorithms to process your signal. Um, and that will also be covered in the hands-on uh, session later this afternoon. Um, so you can use then the two microphone signals. So you can use the microphones from the left and the right side and um, provide more information um, for the processing within the hearing aid and for speech enhancement. Um, yeah. That is typically the case already, so a different setting for listening to music. For example, you um, don't want to have the noise reduction processing on when you listen to music. Um, yeah, yeah, so there are, there are typically different settings, but still um, there are um, distortions um, that are not so easily compensated. For example, the compression algorithm um, and um, other effects. Um, but um, of course, if you, when you're hearing impaired, you're hearing impaired, and um, um, then um, the, the quality of what you hear, depending also on possibly uh, spectral smearing effects in your uh, cochlea, all that contributes um, to the um, decreased experience. Um, no, unfortunately not. Uh, I have not. Uh, that's um, not part in this presentation. Um, there are some references I could give you. Um, so, the, in order to make um, the um, ad adaptive filter converge and identify the true feedback path, you have to 
uh, get rid of the correlation between the signals. And there are some ways to do it by using some linear, pre using linear prediction uh, techniques. Um, then you uh, there are some ways to do it, but um, it's um, uh, not as easy as it looks at first glance. What will the setting? What, setting? what sort of settings? Yeah, for example, um, um, different programs for um, listening to um, speech at home in uh, relatively quiet situations or in very noisy situations where you would um, turn on a beam former um, or some noise reduction processing. Um, programs for music, listening to music, um, and um, yeah, these are the main settings, um, and um, experience shows that users are, um, would not say lazy, but they don't uh, want to um, change these settings all the time manually, so um, some hearing aids have also an automatic uh, environment classification uh, algorithms inside so that they can um, change these settings automatically. Um, usually you have now some remote control um, which would then control both devices. Yes. Yeah, so um, typically, so when you have a hearing loss on both sides, you should also have a hearing aid on both sides in order to uh, regain the localization um, uh, sounds. Okay, I don't see um, further questions, and um, I have here, um, for demonstration purposes, a cochlear implant that I can pass around. It's a demonstration device, so you cannot use it. Um, and uh, the, the main difference to, to the real one is that um, there are no electrodes um, on the uh, um, implantable part. So I can show it to you here. Um, so this is the implantable part that is um, implanted into the skull behind the ear. And there are two um, electrodes. Uh, one is just a reference electrode, and the curly one here at the end, which in fact has no electrodes on it because it's very expensive to manufacture these um, electrodes. But at least this curly end gives you an idea of how large your cochlea is because that's the part that is inserted into your cochlea. So I, um, and then there is the outer speech processor, um, which is then um, as looks like a hearing aid and but has this transmission coil, which is attached via a magnet um, then to the implant uh, through the skin and transmits through the skin the, um, the excitation signals for the electrodes here. Um, and, and then there's also remote control um, that comes with it. So um, I pass this around, and then we have maybe uh, two or three minutes for uh, just... Um, I, I mean, there are some standards, of course, on uh, medical devices and safety of medical devices. So there are some regulations um, uh, around all aspects um, of hearing aids. Some of them are very general. Some are specifically for hearing aids and their performance. But um, there's, there are no standard algorithms. It's not like... Um, mobile communications uh, where you have speech codecs uh, and you need to standardize them in order to um, uh, spread them uh, all over the world and make people use them and be able to communicate uh, across diff devices of different manufacturers and so so essentially there's up to this point not that there's no need really to standardize algorithms um, for these devices 
because they don't you, they don't need to be interoperable between different manufacturers. Um, um, so I, I'm not aware that there's um, an effort to create the standardized um, hearing aid. That, Yes. Yeah, there's some experience from the cell phone uh, community and their limits uh, for cell phones um, as to the radiation and um, um, the, um, the heat that is generated in the tissue um, by um, the radiation. Um, the power levels used in uh, the hearing aids are much, much lower. Um, so um, they, all what I would expect, they can be considered to be safe. Also, you would not use it all the time. You would not have the uh, wireless connection on all the time, uh, simply also for power reasons. Only, for example, use a binaural streaming um, um, the binaural streaming facility only when you are, for example, in a difficult listening situation and you need to do a binaural processing of uh, using all the microphones in order to get the best possible result. Okay, so let's continue. And um, the next slide I... I've uh, depicted a, a typical block diagram of uh, signal processing functions in hearing aids. Um, so typically you have two microphones. These are omnidirectional microphones because this allows you also to combine them into a directional um, microphone. And how this is done, I will show you a bit later. Um, then you have here the feedback cancellation that we talked about already. Um, and then most of the processing is done in frequency bands. So both microphone signals are decomposed into several frequency bands. And that is also dependent on the device and the manufacturer. Um, it could be four in the older devices to eight, 16. Um, but now we're talking more like about 100 uh, channels. Um, then there is directional processing that is uh, combining the two microphones of the device into a beam former. Um, there's possibly an audio mixer uh, that allows you to also integrate a, an audio stream from a wireless interface into um, the um, pathway. Um, there's noise reduction, um, amplification and compression, as explained earlier, and Finally, at the end, you need a synthesis filter bank, especially if you do downsampling here after the analysis filter bank in each of the frequency bands. And as I also briefly mentioned, you prob many devices here have now an automatic classification and control system that switches between programs and comfortable. So I would like to talk now um, about the first part here, the spectral analysis and uh, synthesis part, and um, that's also related to the hands-on exercise later uh, that in the afternoon, and um, also related to the issue of latency, because um, you cannot just use a standard filter bank, um, uh, but you have to optimize it for um, the specific purpose in terms of latency and other aspects. Um, so in the old days, in the analog hearing instruments, <coughs> you had only a very small number of frequency bands because you had uh, to um, um, build them with operation, uh, operational amplifiers and uh, discrete components and so on. There was not a lot of space to do that. Um, but as we have seen, hearing loss sh often shows a strong dependency on frequency. Um, and also, we know that some enhancement schemes perform better when you have a larger 
number of frequency bands available. Um, from the technical point of view, um, there are, of course, a lot of benefits which I don't need to explain in, the, in much detail because also Janis has talked about um, um, uh, the properties of speech signals quite a bit yesterday. Um, but essentially, you can resolve formants and spectral harmonics. Um, you also get some decorrelation of spectral coefficients when you transform the signal from the time into the frequency domain. Um, you might exploit some signal sparsity effects, um, so especially when you have competing talkers. Um, they will not show up at the same time in the same frequency bins. Um, can also include some psychoacoustic model processing models, um, and finally, tip processing in the frequency domain, uh, especially if you downsample your signals um, after the analysis filter bank uh, leads to efficient implementations. Um, a very brief um, reminder of how typical speech spectra look like. Um, so here's a time domain signal the left-hand side on the right-hand side. Um, in blue, the Fourier spectrum of the short-time Fourier transform. The clearly can, you can clearly see the harmonics of the voice sound. And I've also indicated here what we call the envelope. Um, so the spectral shape here represented by an LPC spectrum of order six. Um, and the nice feature about speech is that the envelope can be modeled by a low order filter. Same thing for consonant. Again, here, um, the noisy uh, appearance of a consonant and um, the, the spectrum now looks quite different with an emphasis of high frequencies and again, also the envelope is indicated here in red. So what's the purpose of um, going through the spectral analysis and synthesis? I've uh, given some reasons before, but in terms of enhancement algorithms, we are looking also um, for an optimal performance of these. And, for example, we would like to have um, a transformation that um, gives us a high compact compaction of the signal energy into few transform coefficients so that uh, all the energy is concentrated in a few frequency bands, for example, um, and not spread out, smeared out over a lot of uh, um, bands or coefficients. Um, in this way, we are able then to separate um, the target signal from noisy signals. So that would require for speech, as you can see here again in the spectrogram, would require, uh, require quite a high spectral resolution um, because we want to resolve the harmonics um, of the speech signal in order, for example, to pick out the noise in between um, the speech harmonics. Um, and that would also give us a good separation of speech and noise. Uh, but at the same time, you also would like to have a, a high temporal resolution, um, especially for the transient sounds in speech, because they are also very important for speech intelligibility. And um, obviously, these are conflicting requirements. Um, as you, traditional systems, you cannot get a high frequency resolution and a high temporal resolution uh, easily at the same time. Um, we also like to have a high stop band attenuation of our filter bank, especially on the synthesis part. Why on the synthesis part? Because before the synthesis, we insert these huge gains of 60 dB or 70 dB in order to compensate for the hearing loss. And now if you amplify specific bands by a very high um, gain, um, then also all the... Um, the aliasing artifacts and the imaging artifacts of your filter bank will be also amplified by the same gain. So you need, for the reconstruction of your signal at the synthesis filter bank, you need filters with a high stop end attenuation. Otherwise, you get all kinds of distortions in your system. You would also like perfect or near perfect reconstruction, which means that uh, whatever signal we put in, if you don't modify it, we get it uh, out without any distortions. It's also a nice property to have. And um, as I mentioned several times already, we would like to have a low algorithmic delay. <coughs> because um, otherwise, um, this whole system will not function as we'd like to have it. 
And also, I've mentioned this several times already, a high computational efficiency. Um, there's a lot of requirements, as you can see, and um, you have to make some trade-offs, of course, and uh, balance these, uh, strike a balance in a reasonable way. So what are the methods that are available? Uh, well, the workhorse of digital signal processing is the discrete Fourier transform or the, the fast Fourier transform, um, and that's also related to uniform filter banks. So uniform means that we have uniform spacing of the different bandpass filters, um, and that's a highly scalable um, and non-parametric um, approach of transforming a signal into, into the frequency domain, which can give us high resolution, uh, perfect reconstruction, and it's also highly efficient, so a very good choice. Then there are some non-uniform filter banks, uh, for example, the gamma tone filter bank or uh, other designs um, which um, mimic the resolution of the auditory system. Um, for example, have more narrow filters at low frequencies and wider filters at higher frequencies. Um, typically, they um, do not give you an exact, uh, perfect reconstruction, but they can be designed such that they're near perfect with a relatively low um, distortion. Then there are optimal approaches, um, or also signal-dependent or signal-adaptive approaches like eigenvector, eigenvalue decomposition, subspace approaches. Um, they are, in a way, give you the optimal decomposition, also in the sense that they um, give you the optimal compaction of the signal energy in, in few, only few coefficients that you can then manipulate, um, but they are computationally uh, expensive and uh, currently not feasible um, for hearing aids. And then there are some low delay designs. Um, I like to mention here the so-called low delay filter bank equalizer. Um, um, published by Lollmann and Vari several years ago. And, um, of course, there are also low-order uh, parametric models, um, linear predictive coefficients and metal frequency capsule coefficients. So what I want to do is to show you a design that we developed um, uh, some years ago, and um, which is also, gives you also a lot of flexibility and leads to nice trade-offs um, between... Uh, Computationally efficiency, um, computational efficiency, um, latency, um, uh, frequency resolution, and so on, and and it's all based on what we call the overlap add uh, analysis synthesis system, which you might have seen before. Um, so here is are the samples of the input signal x of k, um, <coughs> k uh, running from the left to the right. Then we take out M signal samples um, and we apply a window function. Can you read this it's large enough? A window function WA uh, to these M samples and then we perform a, a DFT or fast Fourier transform. Then we can do some kind of processing um, on these coefficients and then go back to the time domain by uh, using an IDFT and um, an um, synthesis window, so the time domain samples generated here are then multiplied again by a synthesis window, and that gives us M samples again, which are then overlap added um, with um, the previously processed frames. So here is frame at time lambda minus two, lambda minus one, lambda and lambda, and there's a shift between these uh, signal frames or signal segments, um, and so step by step um, we can process the whole signal by always taking out M samples, multiplying it with a window function, computing the DFT, and then going back um, the whole process. Um, which, uh, with such a system, you can achieve perfect reconstruction if the following, following condition is met. So if you multiply the analysis window here with the synthesis window, and then you overlap add it in the same, with the same pattern as you take out here the signal samples from your signal, then um, this summation over all shifted, multiplied and shifted um, window functions should add up to one, should give you one. So if this 
a succession of um, um, filters, uh, f um, windows adds up to one, um, then you have, an, um, you have met the um, constant overlap add constraint. That means um, you will have no distortions in the uh, analysis synthesis process um, provided that you did not modify the signal in between, of course. Um, okay, so that is one of the conditions that we also will need in the um, hands-on exercise to see whether our windows are really uh, doing the right thing. So we multiply them, then we add them together, and they should add up to one. So here is the standard way of doing this. So this uh, here is the analysis side. We have, um, I've now not indicated the input signal, but just the succession of windows that we are using in our analysis. So here is one, and then we um, shift um, our point of reference by R samples, and then we um, extract the next segment of signals and apply this window here, and then we shift again, and we shift again. So we cover the full signal uh, with this succession of uh, windows. And a typical window which works well is, for example, the Han window. And uh, it's known that if you half overlap this Han window, it gives you this perfect reconstruction. Um, now I said we also want to use a window on the synthesis side for various reasons. Um, so we need to make sure that the product of the analysis and the synthesis window um, gives you the perfect reconstruction. One way to do it is to use here the square root of a Han window for the analysis side and the square root of the Han window um, for the synthesis side. Now, when you multiply them, you get the Han window as a total window, and if you overlap them by half their length, then you get perfect reconstruction. This is shown here in the analysis and the synthesis part. So that's an easy way to create such a perfect reconstruction system. Just take the Han, a square root Han window for the analysis and the square root Han window for the synthesis. Now, um, this um, question I could ask now or even later is, but you might want to think about it already, is the delay or the latency that you get with such a system. How large is that? But let me continue a bit, and then I will ask this question again. Um, so um, the delay of such a system is um, essentially governed by the length of these windows. And if these windows are long, because you want to have a high frequency resolution, for a high frequency resolution, you need to put a lot of data into your spectral analysis in order to get the high resolution. Um, that requires a long analysis window, then the delay might be too long for our purposes. Um, so um, the idea is to modify the system now in order to achieve a low delay or low latency spectral analysis system and possibly also with an adaptive resolution. And the key idea is to use non-symmetric analysis windows and relatively short windows for synthesis. So how does this work? Well, uh, there's one more line here. Latency is, I, oh, okay, here's the answer to, your, to the question already. <laughs> um, so the latency that you then get is identical to the length of the synthesis window, and I will explain later why this is the case. Um, so here on this graph, if you just focus on the figure here first, on the left-hand side, you see the uh, traditional way to do it, the way I explained it, using the square root hun window in blue for the analysis and in red the, um, for, um, for synthesis, the synthesis windows, and they are both the same. And if you multiply them, you get the Han window, and if you overlap them by half, you get perfect reconstruction. So our design now uh, looks a bit different here on the right-hand side. We are still, um, still using um, some type of um, window here uh, which looks maybe not similar to this one here, but a bit compressed for the synthesis part. But now we, we are using this long and non-symmetric window for the analysis part. And the key idea, idea here is to use in the synthesis only uh, the first part of whatever 
is analyzed here by this long window. So by using this long window here for the analysis part, we get a high frequency resolution because you're putting a lot of data into the analysis. And by reconstructing only the first part of this analysis window here in the synthesis process by applying this red window here, this dashed red window, we are keeping the delay short um, because we are just reconstructing a short portion of what we analyzed before. And this um, allows us to control the trade-off between uh, delay and um, computational efficiency and um, spectral properties um, quite easily because we can make essentially the synthesis window arbitrarily short, in principle at least. You can reduce it to a single tap, for example, um, and that would lead then to um, a very unsymmetric analysis window, but um, you can easily see or imagine that by making, for example, the synthesis window wider, we could then go um, uh, in um, uh, continuously um, to this situation where both windows would be the same by just making this wider and then uh, making this less unsymmetric. Yeah. Yeah, I like to explain that. Uh, I just, maybe we take... Um, Take, wait for two more slides, and then I have a good uh, um, illustration for it. Okay, so um, the idea is to use a unsymmetric long analysis window and a relatively short synthesis window. Okay, and then the next idea is that now you can um, make this adaptive, adaptive to the type of speech sounds that you have. So, for example, when you're analyzing a vowel, you w would like to have this high frequency resolution because you want to see really the harmonics of the vowel in order to differentiate between speech and noise. Um, so for analyzing a vowel, you would um, use an analysis window like this here. And um, this goes along then with the synthesis window, which is relatively short because we want to have the short delay. But for a situation where you would like to have a high temporal resolution, um, you could use a short analysis window and also then a short synthesis window. And one of the tricks here is that now with this design, you can um, switch between these windows and you can create arbitrary uh, other uh, pairs of windows um, at any time without losing the perfect reconstruction property. And why is this the case? The case or the trick is that the um, right-hand slope of this window function is always the same function. So it could be, for example, the, uh, the right-hand side of a square root Hun window. So the right-hand side is always the same here and also here and here and here. So when you multiply them, you always get a Hun window um, on the right-hand side. And by design, you also make sure that when you multiply the analysis and the synthesis window, you also get a Hun window on the left-hand side. So if you multiply these, these are standard square root Hun windows for analysis and win synthesis. It's absolutely clear that you get a Hun window um, as a product. And here, you might have noticed that this shape here is a bit distorted and this is because this is multiplied with this um, window here, and this is, there's also a bit of a slope here um, in this part of your analysis window, and that's compensated here in the shape of um, your synthesis window. So if you multiply these two windows, you also get a Hun window of length two times M. Now you can switch between these pairs of windows arbitrarily, depending on what sound you're analyzing, and always achieve um, perfect reconstruction. Okay, so now here um, is another depiction of the process, um, um, the long window, and then uh, here we switch to the short window and um, um, stay, for example, uh, with the short windows. And the synthesis process 
also need to switch the synthesis window, but it's, we always use a short synthesis window. So now back to the question, so why is the delay identical to the length of the synthesis window? Well, in order to um, be able to process the next section of your input signal, you need to collect R samples. So assume you have processed um, um, this frame here, um, the last long signal frame. In order to be able um, to um, the frame shift, yeah, the shift, yeah. Um, in, I just wonder. Um, okay, in or, okay, yeah. In order to process the next frame, so uh, if you can process the last long frame here, if you have collected all your input data up to this point here, and then in order to be able to process this next short frame here, you need another R sample. So you have to wait for R sample. That's the frame shift, the frame advance, and then. At this point here, you can process this data. No, the long window just reaches into the past. And you also, the long windows are just shifted by R samples. They are always shifted by R samples. And so you just need to wait for the next R samples in order to be able to process the next frame of the signal. Yes, the overlap is bigger in the analysis side, but you're also you're only using old information, past samples, which you already have, so you don't need to wait. At the analysis side, you don't need to wait um, when you're using a long window. You always need R fresh signal samples, and then you can uh, process the next frame, analyze the next frame. So this is the analysis side. So for, on the analysis side, we need R samples, so we get a delay of R samples. Now on the synthesis side, uh, we have only short windows, uh, regardless of what analysis window we are using here. We have only short windows, and um, these windows, whenever have, we have processed one, they overlap with previous windows by uh, the length minus R. So we can, um, whenever we have processed, for example, this segment here, which we can process in this point, um, we have this information, but this overlaps or needs to be combined with the information of the previous uh, signal frame. So we can start out um, uh, streaming um, the samples out at this point here. So when we, we could start processing here at this point, and we can then um, uh, stream out uh, samples at this point because they uh, will be overlapped. And in total, this amounts to just one length of the synthesis filter. So that is, um, the trick is really to use always a short synthesis filter. And by making the synthesis filter shorter, you can then um, uh, make this delay or this latency arbitrarily short. I, I'm, yeah? Yes, uh, there are clearly disadvantages, for example, stop end attenuation. So there's this kind of trade off, yes. Yeah. So you, um, you can only make it very short if you do not downsample much in between. But if you want to have a high downsampling ratio between your time domain signal and your frequency bands, then you also need a decent um, synthesis filter. Otherwise, you have uh, too many distortions. Okay, but nevertheless, this is an easy way to achieve perfect reconstruction. And as I said, you can start with the square root Hun windows, and then you can design families of window pairs and um, design them for specific speech sounds so that you get high spectral resolution when you need it for vowels, for example, and high temporal resolution when you need it for transient sounds.
Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, if you really think it to the end, you would need some classification. Um, um, I have some more slides on this, but we just uh, where we just look at points of transients, uh, transient behavior in the signal or non-stationarity in the signal, and then we switch whenever we see something non-stationary. And when we are in a stationary vowel, we just use a long window. Binary, I think, one type of window, the other. In the system we implemented, we used only two types of windows to not make it overly complicated. But in principle, you could uh, use four, five, six yeah. different versions. Um, well, we, in this case, it's um, it's um, um, you could use, uh, for example, a pruned DFT because whenever you use the short windows, you have um, a lot of zero samples, which you um, um, which you get from your window. Um, but um, we have not optimized it to the last bit because um, there are lots of variations of FFT algorithms um, which you could then uh, use to optimize the performance or the efficiency. But um, one good um, approach here certainly is to use a pruned DF, uh, FFT algorithm which uh, avoids processing zero samples. Yeah, but that's because... Yes. But in the case of the... Yeah. I'm willing to use Yes. No. You introduce the previous of the DFT. Yeah. Not necessarily to compute everything. So I mean that this should be very important. Yeah, it is important, but I'm um, I'm not sure they can be used with any type of window. That's why I, um, I, 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 <laughs> that I, I and I'm afraid to say probably not. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I, that is actually a very interesting problem. Yeah. This type of windows, how the yeah. DFT can be yeah. Yeah. Uh, adjusted. Yeah, yeah. You probably need to compensate um, yeah. somehow, and. Um, Okay, so what uh, can be gained by such a scheme? Um, here is um, a very um, theoretical or best case um, um, experiment where we say, okay, we, have <clears throat> we are looking for transient signals and we have here some noise in this part of the signal and suddenly there is a burst of some signal. It's really just a constructed signal here, um, a synthetic signal. Um, so here is noise, and here is now the signal, the noise plus um, some burst signal, and then we analyze um, these the signal with either a long window <coughs> or a short window, shown here, or ours um, as re rectangular windows, shown here as rectangular windows, or we use our um, specifically designed windows, which are tapered windows. Um, so the rectangular window here serves more like a, um, a reference best case uh, limit case because with a rectangular window, you would capture all the energy um, here in this burst right away. And what you get is um, this um, gain function where we have here the SNR um, on the x-axis, so ranging from minus 15 to 30 dB, and here um, the power gain that you get by using a shorter window to analyze this transient burst. And this is shown in relation um, to the length of the long window. So the solid lines are for the uh, rectangular windows. We can ignore them for now. And the dashed lines are um, for these um, tapered windows um, that we just designed. And you can see here that at a certain SNR, say 10 dB, and a certain ratio of the long and the short window, so for example, the short window has 64 taps and the long 512, you can gain up to um, 6 dB more power. You can concentrate, you can say it like this, you can concentrate um, up to 6 dB more power into your spectral bins. But this is also, as I said, a best 
case constructed signal. So realistic is that you could possibly get half of it, maybe 2, 3 dB of uh, power concentration uh, by s switching to shorter windows whenever you have a transient and not just continuing with a long analysis window and smearing out all the information of the transient window. Um, then, as I uh, said, uh, we designed a, a maximum likelihood detector. Um, I don't want to go into detail here, but essentially this allows us um, to detect uh, transient um, signals and um, um, non-stationarity, uh, non-stationarities in the signal. And um, the typical diagram looks like this. So this is a detector performance and um, where these lines here indicate the detection threshold that you can pre-select and above here in this area, this is the area that you um, can uh, detect then as a transient. And just to give you an idea what it means, so for high SNRs, so here again we have the SNR as a parameter, for high SNRs you can detect very small steps in the power. So here in the vertical axis we see the, the power step that comes along with the transient or this um, non-stationarity. So at high SNRs it's very easy of course to detect also a small increase in power. So here this region is reaches down here to 10 dB or 5 dB. While if you go to negative input SNRs, it becomes very hard to detect. In fact, it becomes impossible to detect very small changes in the power. But if the power change is relatively large, um, then we are still able to detect it. And the dotted or gray shaded um, blobs here and points here are um, taken from the TIMID database. These are the T sounds or T phonemes uh, plotted into this diagram in terms of um, the signal-to-noise ratio, um, uh, 10 dB segmental signal-to-noise ratio experiment, and the kind of power change that we saw. And you can see here on the right-hand side the T sound that could be detected um, with this detector. Um, they are here in this area, and um, that's not all of them. So there are also some T sounds which uh, cannot be detected because they are too weak, they, the, the power change is not strong enough, but um, most of them can be detected. No, no. So we do some assumptions that the signal is Gaussian and we do some statistics on the signal and then co mostly con construct a maximum likelihood detector by comparing the power um, before and after or for short and long windows. Um, and then make a decision whether this is still stationary or it's non-stationary. And in the effect, hopefully you can see this here um, um, in the spectrogram. Um, this is a spectrogram using the long analysis window only. Um, and this, the lower graph is a spectrogram using the adaptive window switching technique where we also indicated the points here where the system uh, uh, detected um, transients and used this short window. So the, here in this range, the long window was used, and here uh, the short window. You can clearly see that the transients are now sticking out more prominently than uh, uh, without using this, just using um, the short, uh, the long analysis window here. So um, this gives you some um, improvement gains. Okay, once more, um, a window design example, um, because we will need that in the hands-on, um, but I will also explain it again then. Um, so um, if you're just looking at one pair you, uh, of windows and you want to use a long analysis window and you want to keep the latency short, then you can design it such that the right edge here is taken from a square root Han window and you could take also the left edge here, the left side from a long square root Han window and simply glue them together at this point here. So that is the most easiest or the easiest way to construct these windows. Just take um, 
a short hand, square root hand window for the right hand side and a long square root hand window for the left hand side, glue them together and then you have your long window. And for the synthesis window, which should be always short in order because the delay is governed by, this, uh, by the length of the synthesis window, you use the right half of the short square root hand window, so exactly the same part of that you have used here for the long window, you use here on the right hand side again, because then the product will give you a, simply a hand window. And for the left hand side, you use um, a hand window, which will then be multiplied by this um, part of your analysis window. So you need to correct for this uh, distortion that you get here. And this is why it does look a bit distorted here as well. But when you multiply this part here of your analysis window with this part here, um, then you get also a hand window on the left-hand side. And the rest is multiplied by zeros. That doesn't matter anyhow. Okay, so that's the design rule for um, one pair of these windows, um, which gives you already some uh, decent performance. But if you really want to... Um, use it in a hearing aid, you, you need to, um, in the end, optimize them numerically um, in order to get really the stop-end performance and all that. Okay. Um, I have a few more slides on um, some very basic stuff, which is power spectrum estimation, because we also need that in the hands-on uh, later on. Um, but I'm pretty sure you know all that, so I can do these slides fairly quickly, but uh, of course you can stop me anytime, and if you have questions, please. Uh... Um, so once we are in the spectral domain, for to control the enhancement algorithms, the noise reduction algorithms, you typically need a, um, a power spectrum estimate as well of the incoming signal, for example. And um, for deterministic signals, um, where x of k is a signal and x of e to the j omega is a Fourier transform, um, the power spectrum is just the magnitude squared of the Fourier transform. That's well known. Um, for stochastic signals, um, the power spectral density is defined as a Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function. That's probably also well known. Um, so here's the autocorrelation function written as a statistical expectation of xk multiplied with a shifted version of x. K, and the Fourier transform is then the power spectrum. And then, obviously, an estimate of the power spectrum can be obtained by computing first the autocorrelation function or estimating the autocorrelation function and using the Fourier transform. Then you have an estimate of the power spectrum. Um, this, while this type of autocorrelation estimate, so that's the estimate for the autocorrelation function, is unbiased and consistent, um, um, consistent means that when you use um, more data, then um, it will converge to the true value. Um, after the Fourier transform, unfortunately, the power spectrum estimate is not um, unbiased anymore. So we use different methods. And a good way to start is because we are already in the spectral domain after our analysis filter bank is to... Um, use the Fourier coefficients directly and to use a magnitude squared Fourier coefficients or Fourier transform. And that's called the periodogram um, because that gives you an indication also of periodic components uh, in your signal. So you simply take the output of your DFT um, analysis stage and take the magnitude squared. You can normalize it. That's just a normalization. And that uh, gives you an estimate um, of the um, periodogram, and that can be computed by just taking the DFT coefficients and magnitude squared of it, square of it. Um, now, if you use a tapered analysis window, which we always do because we want to have uh, better spectral properties on the analysis side, then we um, have a so-called modified periodogram because now the signal here is multiplied with um, the window function, and then we compute the Fourier transform, and then we take the magnitude square. And in order to uh, make it um, have a power of the window, um, unity power, 
you also normalize it then on the energy of our window function. Okay, so this is a periodogram, and um, the properties um, essentially are derived by um, um, taking, again, the statistical expectation of our periodogram. Um, this is just some, um, some other way to write the periodogram that's not so important here. Important is that if you take the statistical expectation of the periodogram, then essentially you find that it's a Fourier transform of the, um, the autocorrelation function as should be, but the autocorrelation function is tapered um, before you do the FFT or the, before you do the Fourier transform, and that means um, you get some bias in your um, periodogram. So because of these finite limits of summation, whenever you use the DFT, you have only a finite set of data. The periodogram is a biased estimator of the power spectrum. Um, the periodogram is a sub asymptotically unbiased if you let m, so the DFT lengths, go to infinity. Um, but unfortunately, the variance, any estimator also has a variance, does not approach zero if you use long chunks of data. So the periodogram is not a consistent estimator of um, your power spectrum. Um, so whenever you put more data in your DFT, so you make your window longer, the additional information is used to increase the frequency resolution. You get more frequency bins out of it. So if you put M signal samples into your DFT, you get M frequency bands or bins out of it. So all the additional information in your data is used to increase the frequency resolution when you increase the window length, but not to reduce the variance. So whenever we use... Uh, the DFT coefficients as a power spectrum estimate, we need to do some smoothing. That is a message here. You cannot use the, um, or you should not use the periodogram directly as a power estimate because it has a high variance and it doesn't help to increase the DFT length, but you should do some smoothing in order to achieve a low variance power spectral estimate. Okay, so consistent estimates of the power spectrum require some form of smoothing, and um, the most obvious way is simply to collect several successive frames of your signal and average them. That is called your non-recursive um, smoothing, and where you simply do a summation of several of these um, periodograms, successive periodograms, but that's inefficient for most algorithms because you need to store all these past um, periodograms in order to average them. You need a lot of memory, and you need to do this, this summation and so on. A better way is to do it recursively as a first-order recursive process, and this is, again, a, an equation that we will need uh, in the afternoon. Um, so here we use simply a first-order recursive system um, with a parameter alpha um, to um, uh, generate a running estimate um, of our power spectrum. So here, again, is the input periodogram of the new frame, of the uh, latest frame. Um, we multiply it by 1 minus alpha, and then we take the last estimate we had, multiply it by alpha, and add it to this. And this gives us a new estimate for the new frame at point, at time lambda plus 1. Mu, by the way, is a frequency bin index here. Lambda is the frame index. And so this is a very easy way to um, um, compute uh, power spectral density of a signal X when you have the DFT coefficients available. Simply take the magnitude square, 1 minus alpha. And by alpha, you can control the duration or the, the effective um, uh, range of um, smoothing. We'll need in the hands-on, we will need to compute uh, three power spectra, spectral densities in order to construct our enhancement filter, and we will use this equation here. But we will not do the normalization because the normalization cancels out later. Um, so you don't need to do that necessarily in the algorithm later on because it will cancel out um, in the processing anyhow. Okay. That was the second part of the first part. And um, I guess you're all 
hungry and uh, the area is, I guess, ready uh, to go there. But nevertheless, if you have one or two questions, we could. Right. And now. Yeah. Yeah, in, in a way, they are both low-pass filters. One is a non-recursive, and one is a recursive yeah. low-pass filters. So this here, the lower one, corresponds to a um, moving average with an exponential weighting. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So this is in a way beneficial. The recursive or this exponential weighting is in a way beneficial because it gives more weight to the more recent data and less weight to the older data. So especially for non-stationary signals, um, this recursive form is um, preferable. It's also preferable because you need to store only this guy here. Um, this, uh, la yeah, yeah, yeah. While this is a summation with, a, we could think of a rectangular window. And this would amount to um, moving average with uh, a exponential window. <laughs> 